Yes, Ms Orr. Commissioner, we turn to a case study concerning the steps taken by one superannuation fund, Q Super, to make its products and services accessible to its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members in remote communities. Evidence in this case study will be given by Ms Lynn Melser, Head of Technical Advice for the Board of Q Super. This case study follows on from evidence that was given in the previous round of hearings in which we considered issues affecting consumers in regional and remote communities, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, in their dealings with financial services entities. The evidence given in those hearings included evidence about the interactions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in remote communities with superannuation funds. In our closing statement at the conclusion of that round of hearings, we said that we would return to this issue in this round of hearings when superannuation funds have been granted leave to appear and could engage with the issues raised. Our work during and in the lead up to the last round of hearings suggested that a significant issue affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities was their ability to engage with superannuation funds and to access their superannuation. We heard that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities are unaware of their superannuation entitlements. Even when they are aware of those entitlements, they often have difficulty accessing them because of difficulties caused by their remote location and because of the way in which legislative know your customer requirements are applied by superannuation funds. We also learnt that the legislative framework is not flexible enough to permit Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to nominate individuals outside their immediate family but within their kinship structure as their chosen beneficiaries for superannuation entitlements. We heard evidence from three individuals about the difficulties faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when seeking access to their superannuation entitlements. They were Mr Nathan Boyle, a senior policy analyst in ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program. Mr Boyle's statement is Exhibit 4.138. Mrs Linda Edwards, the Coordinator of Financial Capability at Financial Counselling Australia. Mrs Edwards' statement is Exhibit 4.140. And Mr Philip Bowden, a financial counsellor with Anglicare Northern Territory. Mr Bowden's statement is Exhibit 4.200. Before explaining aspects of this evidence, the evidence of these three people in a bit more detail, we note Mr Boyle's evidence that there is as much diversity amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in terms of financial knowledge and capability as there is in the general population. Mrs Edwards' evidence was that issues around superannuation take up an enormous amount of time for financial counsellors and capability workers who assist Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote and regional communities. Mr Bowden estimated that dealing with superannuation issues for his clients took up approximately 80% of his time. Mrs Edwards described negotiating the system of superannuation for Aboriginal people as being like trying to swim upstream in a river that's really, really heavy and hard. Both Mrs Edwards and Mr Boyle explained that these difficulties led to an underutilisation of superannuation entitlements and insurance, associated insurance entitlements. In Mrs Edwards' words, you're just tired from swimming upstream and so you give up. And by giving up, you're losing out on things that could actually benefit you. Mr Boyle explained that it was not unusual for him to hear reports of financial counsellors meeting with Indigenous people and finding out that they are totally and permanently disabled and have a policy that they can make a claim for under their superannuation, but where the time for making a claim had expired because people weren't made aware that it existed. 
The key themes identified by Mr Boyle, Mrs Edwards and Mr Bowden were as follows. First, there are a number of obstacles that are faced by some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in remote communities which are common across their dealings with different types of financial services entities. These include difficulties associated with geographical isolation, language and literacy, a lack of understanding about the way in which financial products work, issues associated with kinship obligations and identification issues. Second, a number of these general difficulties manifest in particular ways in the superannuation context. In relation to financial literacy, Mrs Edwards explained that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional and remote communities do not understand how superannuation works and don't have the confidence to interact with the system without assistance. These difficulties can be compounded in circumstances where English is a person's second or third language, particularly where superannuation forms use complex <coughs> terms or jargon. They can be further compounded by different funds using different forms and different identification and certification procedures. In addition, Mr Boyle explained that some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people contextualise superannuation as being similar to stolen wages. He said that it was quite difficult sometimes for people who have had their wages taken from them to learn about a bank account that they can only access once they are old and that they hear many of their family members passing away before they get the benefit of the money. Mr Boyle said that this idea of superannuation was one of the reasons why Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can give up in their dealings with superannuation funds at what might seem like a relatively small hurdle. In relation to identification issues, Mr Boyle explained that historically speaking, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been subject to numerous government policies including policies around the removal of children. As a result, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional and remote communities do not register births, deaths or marriages. Not having a birth certificate makes it difficult to obtain other forms of identification, such as a driver's licence. Even where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do hold a form of identification, their identification might be in a range of names. As Mr Boyle explained, an individual might have their traditional skin name, a birth name and an adoptive name. And it's not uncommon to see people having identification documents in all three of those names. Mr Boyle said that it was also not uncommon for multiple dates of birth to be listed on identification documents. Mr Boyle explained that when government departments issue birth certificates a significant period of time after someone is born, they register the birth as either 1 January or 1 July in the year that the person believes that they were born. This may lead to a situation in which both a government attributed birthday and a person's actual birthday are listed on different forms of identification documents. Mrs Edward's evidence was that most financial counsellors working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders spend the majority of their day's work trying to help these people prove their identity. In relation to geographical remoteness, Mr Boyle explained that even where a person has a full set of identification documents, having such documents copied or certified in a way that meets superannuation funds requirements can cause significant, significant difficulties in remote communities. Mrs Edwards explained that particular difficulties arose when superannuation funds required that forms be filled out sequentially rather than all at once. Mr Boyle also explained that geographical remoteness created particular difficulties in relation to medical certifications required for early access to superannuation or in relation to claims on insurance policies held within superannuation. In many situations, 
medical certification must be undertaken by two independent medical experts. This poses significant difficulties if a community is only serviced by the flying doctor service. In that case, Mr Boyle characterised it as almost impossible for a very ill person to get two medical professions to certify that. Mr Boyle also referred to the impact of kinship structures on dealing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with superannuation funds. He explained that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have obligations to a range of other people in their communities outside their immediate family unit. This gives rise to partic particular difficulties in the context of deceased estates because in Mr Boyle's words, the superannuation system tends to have a focus on the nuclear family. For many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, those family members will not be the appropriate people to receive the estate. The appropriate people might instead be people who are not permitted under our legislative scheme to receive that payment. Mrs Edwards also referred to difficulties flowing from reduced Indigenous life expectancy and from the fact that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional and remote communities die intestate. Mr Boyle referred to the complex and costly process for determining whether a deceased family member has superannuation entitlements which he considered could deter Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from investigating their options. In recent years, there has been increasing recognition of some of these problems, and some initiatives have been developed to try and address them. These include the establishment of the Indigenous Superannuation Working Group, the release by Austrac of updated guidance in relation to the customer identification of people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background, and an event known as the Big Super Day Out. We'll say something briefly about each of these developments. The Indigenous Superannuation Working Group was established in May 2013. It is a cross-industry initiative that seeks to improve superannuation outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The working group's members include superannuation industry bodies, representatives from some superannuation funds, and representatives of the First Nations Foundation. The objective of the working group is to improve the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians when it comes to access to and engagement with superannuation. The Working Group held an Indigenous Super Summit in 2015 and again in 2016, which brought together government agencies, industry representatives and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advocates. Delegates at the 2016 summit worked together to draw up a list of next steps for the superannuation industry. These included consideration and implementation of the Austrac guidance, which we'll come to, across all funds, consideration of an Indigenous culturally trained unit of caseworkers, working with insurers around claims management and processing, consideration of whether forms could be simplified and standardised, and collection and sharing of better data relevant to Indigenous engagement with superannuation. The second key development that's occurred in recent years is the development of the Austrac guidance in relation to identification requirements for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Austrac requires reporting entities to have an anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing program that specifies how each reporting entity identifies, mitigates and manages the risk of its products or services being misused to facilitate money laundering or terrorism financing. A framework for identifying customers must be established as part of this program so that the reporting entity can be reasonably satisfied <coughs> that a customer is who they claim to be and for collecting and verifying customer information. This includes the collection of certain minimum know your customer information. In July 2016, coinciding with NAIDOC week, Austrac 
updated its guidance in relation to these customer identification requirements. The updated guidance was developed in consultation with the financial sector and other government agencies. Ms Melser will give evidence about her role in this process. The updated guidance recognises that some customers may not have identification documents that reporting entities most commonly use to establish and verify the identity of their customers, or that the information contained in the documents may no longer be accurate or up to date. As a result, these people may face barriers in their access to financial services. The updated guidance clarifies the identification obligations of financial services entities insofar as they relate to people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background. It recommends that where appropriate, reporting entities consider adopting a flexible approach to the identification and verification of such persons, while remaining mindful of social and cultural sensitivities. This may include using reliable and independent means of alternative identification for customers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage. Alternative identification documentation may be a statement by a referee addressing their knowledge of the person's name, address, date of birth or other information. The guidance provides examples of who may be a referee including the chairperson, secretary or CEO of an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander organisation, a board member of a local Aboriginal land council, a school principal or school councillor, a health professional or manager in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander medical services, or a community leader or recognised elder. During the previous round of hearings, Mrs Edwards and Mr Boyle both gave evidence about the implementation of the Austrac guidance. Mrs Edwards said that the processes outlined in the Austrac guidance are not always used by financial services entities. Mr Boyle said that the Austrac guidance has been taken up by financial services institutions at the head office level, but alternative guidance or alternative ways for Indigenous people to identify themselves to financial services providers hasn't filtered down to the customer facing staff or to the telephone staff. Mr Boyle said that whilst the guidance is there and we see commitment to implementing it by the financial services industry, we're still not seeing a real reduction in the difficulties that people are having identifying themselves on the ground. The third key development in recent years is the Big Super Day Out. This is an outreach initiative designed and coordinated by the First Nations Foundation to help Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people find their lost super, consolidate multiple superannuation accounts and generally to educate the community on the benefits of superannuation. The Big Super Day Out brings together superannuation funds, the Australian Tax Office, the Department of Human Services, the ASIC Indigenous Outreach Program and community partners to provide a one-stop shop on the day. Since 2016, the Big Super Day Out has been held in a number of locations, including Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. In the nine Big Super Day Out events held so far, over 750 people have been assisted and $3.7 million of lost super has been reunited with Indigenous members. However, as may be apparent from what we've said, despite these beneficial initiatives, serious obstacles still remain. The evidence given in the previous round of hearings indicated that one underlying issue is the lack of information held by financial services entities uh, about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. Mrs Edwards told the Commission that in work done this year, the, the First Nations Foundation found that no one could actually answer the question, will Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have enough super for their retirement because of the identity issue? 
We heard that financial services entities are not asking customers the question of whether they consider themselves to be Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. This may raise a question as to whether entities require such information to be able to act in the best interests of those customers. There's been some limited research undertaken into the superannuation entitlements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. In 2016, the CSIRO Monash Superannuation Research Cluster published a working paper titled Requirement, I'm sorry, Retirement Adequacy of Indigenous Australians. The working paper notes that while there is literature to provide an adequate understanding of the requirements retirement outcomes of a typical worker, very little or no research has been dedicated to understanding the retirement outcomes associated with the most disadvantaged workers. The paper estimates that the retirement gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is 23%. The study also found that Indigenous Australians have a superannuation balance at retirement with a mean that is 46% lower than what is required for a comfortable retirement. A further report has been undertaken by Challenger, a research partner in a 2016 Australian Research Council linkage project entitled Indigenous Super – Better Outcomes in Retirement. The report concluded that on average, Indigenous people, particularly current retirees, have lower superannuation coverage and lower balances than the general population. The report found that differences in age structure mean that retirement milestones capture a much smaller proportion of the Indigenous population than the wider population. Consequently, less Indigenous people are living long enough to enjoy the benefit of their retirement savings. The report noted that there are several areas where more research is necessary to better understand the retirement circumstances of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In his evidence in the previous round of hearings, Mr Boyle from ASIC told the Commission that in 2014, he took Ms Melsa from Q Super on a visit to the Lockhart River community in far north Queensland, where there were many Indigenous Q Super members. He and Ms Melsa met with a significant number of people who were unable to access their superannuation entitlements and they provided them with assistance. The Commission asked Ms Melsa to provide a statement about her visit to Lockhart River, the effects of that visit and QSuper's involvement in a number of subsequent initiatives. Ms Melsa will shortly give evidence on those topics. Mr Boyle also told the Commission that it would be of real benefit to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people if there was a concerted effort to make sure that all of the members of financial services entities, right down to the coalface, to the people who are on the telephone or who are dealing face to face with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are aware of the policies that have been agreed to by the industry. This case study will also examine the way in which Q Super has attempted to do this. Now, Commissioner, with that introduction, I call Ms Lynn Melsa of Q Super. Yes, Ms Melsa. Can you come into the witness box, please? <coughs> Ms Melsa, before you sit down, can I ask you whether you would prefer to be sworn or to make an affirmation? Sworn, please. Yes, can we swear the witness, please? If you just would stay standing. Thank you. Please repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but. The and truth. nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Mills. I do sit down. Yes, Mr. Kelly. Uh, your full name is Lynette Margaret Melser. Yes. And you are the head of technical advice for the Q Super Board. Yes. And your business address is Level 1370 Eagle Street, Brisbane. Yes. You've received a summons to attend to give evidence today. Yes, I have. 
Do you have that summons with you today? Yes, I do. I tend to that. Exhibit 5.138, the summons to Ms Meltzer. You've made a statement to the Commission dated 30 July 2018? Yes, I did. Do you have that statement with you? Yes, I have. I tender that statement. Exhibit 5.139, the statement of Ms Meltzer of 30 July 18. That's the evidence in chief. Thank you. <coughs> yes, Ms Orr. Ms Meltzer, you've been with Q Super since 1981, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and QSuper is Queensland's largest superannuation fund? Yes, that's correct. And based on funds under management, it is the third largest superannuation fund in Australia? Yes, that's correct. What is the quantum of funds approximately, approximately currently under management at QSuper? The, the funds under management are approximately $104 billion. Now, QSuper is the default superannuation fund for all employees of Queensland government departments. Yes, that is correct. And it's also the default superannuation fund for employees of a number of Queensland government agencies. Yes, that's correct. So your members include teachers, nurses, emergency services workers, uh, police officers, firefighters, council workers? Uh, not council workers, all the others it does though. Thank you. And how many members, approximately, does QSuper have? Approximately 580,000 members. And QSuper is a public sector fund, is that right? That is correct. And could you explain what's meant by that? Uh, QSuper, the QSuper's origins are in state-based legislation. It commenced in 1913. And a superannuation fund established under legislation is referred to as a public sector fund. And QSuper describes itself as a profit for member fund. Could you explain that? Yes, it, it, there actually are two terms. One's profit for member, one is not for profit. Pretty much they're synonymous terms. Yes. And does QSuper provide insurance to its members? Uh, yes, it does. And what types of insurance? Uh, death, total and permanent disability and income protection. Thank you. Now, you're currently the Head of Technical Advice for the QSuper Board. Yes, that's correct. And you've been in that role or a similar role since 2003? Yes, that is correct. And could you explain what your responsibilities are in that role? Yeah, as a public sector fund, my primary role is to manage the state-based legislation and to provide uh, resolution to complex member matters for QSuper. Uh, could I ask you to look at a document that QSuper has provided us, Ms Melser? It's QSU 0008 0002 0072. Now, this is a slide pack that was prepared in connection with the launch of QSuper's Reconciliation Action Plan earlier this year? Yes, correct. Now, if we turn to 0080, Uh, we see there, I'm sorry, we see there an estimate that QSuper has made of the number of its members who are Indigenous, is that right? Um, yeah, well, we did an estimation of the number of our members in far north Queensland um, who, uh, in a, who live in remote and very remote communities, and we also know that Indigenous people tend, uh, tend to be the most common person living in a remote community, so that's pure estimation, but yes. yes. And you needed to estimate because you don't ask your members whether or not they identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait no, Islander not. people. Uh, I want to come back to that. But this estimate um, that is contained in your Reconciliation Action Plan presentation uh, is based on you uh, choosing certain postcodes in far north Queensland that you understand to be predominantly populated by Indigenous people. Is that right? That is correct. In, in Queensland, there, there's actually two postcodes that cover that whole area. I see. The far north Queensland far area? Far north Queensland, yes. So we see that the total number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members is estimated as 5,648. Yes. And we see a pictorial representation of where some of those members live. That's correct. And we see that 293 members are estimated to live in Lockhart River. That's number eight on the diagram. 
Yes, correct. And we see from these figures that the vast majority of Q-Supers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members live in regional, remote or very remote parts of Queensland. Is that right? We believe that to be the case, yes. Thank you. Now, I tend to this statement at uh, this document, Commissioner. Uh, Q-Super Reconciliation Action Plan launch. 2018 QSU 0008002 0072 Exhibit 5.140. So I want to ask you some questions, Ms Melser, about your trip to Lockhart River with Mr Boyle from ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program in 2014 and how that trip has shaped your understanding uh, of issues affecting vulnerable people, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities when engaging with their superannuation. Uh, you're familiar with the evidence that Mr Boyle and Mrs Edwards and yes, Mr Bowden gave in the previous round of hearings? Yes, I am. Uh, and you would have seen that Mr Boyle gave evidence that since that trip to Lockhart River in 2014, you have become, in his words, a real champion of Indigenous superannuation issues. Yeah, I am aware of Nathan's view. Now, as we've uh, just seen from, and we see from the uh, images on the screen, Lockhart River's in far north Queensland. It's about 2,500 kilometres from Brisbane, is that right? That's correct. And what's the nearest regional centre to Lockhart River? Uh, Cairns is probably the most, the closest. And how far away is Cairns? I think it's about 450 kilometres, I believe. And how do you get to Lockhart River? You fly from Brisbane to Cairns on one day, effectively, and then the next day you catch another plane from Cairns out to Lockhart River on a Skytrain, a, a regional plane. Mm -hmm. And do you know what the approximate population of Lockhart River is? Approximately 600 people. And do you know what proportion of those 600 people are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people? No, I don't know. I would estimate a, a very large proportion. And how long did you spend in Lockhart River on this trip? We spent three full days working with the community in Lockhart River. And what did you observe firstly about life in Lockhart River? My first recollection is Lockhart River is a beautiful place. Um, it's, life is quiet, I suppose, as an observation. Um, it's, I wouldn't say harsh, um, but it's not city life at all. Um, and did you meet with Q Super members while you were in Lockhart River? Yes, we actually met over, we worked with over 100 community members, and but we weren't just dealing with Q Super members, we worked with whatever, whatever the people in Lockhart River needed us to help them with, we helped them with. So there were four funds actually, predominantly we worked with. I see, so the 100 community members that you met with were members of four different superannuation funds? Correct. One of those was QSuper? Yes, correct. What were the other three funds? The other three were SunSuper, AMP and um, LGIA Super. QSuper was by far the largest number of members that we saw, but we did help all members. And what did the community members tell you about their experiences with superannuation? Um, it was more what they showed us than what they, they told us. Um, the first thing I suppose I noticed was difficulties. Clearly they had difficulties with um, meeting our rules of identification. Um, driver's licences didn't exist, passports didn't exist. There are the two main features that, that superannuation funds use to identify. Um, and then people who did have driver's licences or birth certificates, which were also very, very often they were wrong. Um, we had one gentleman came and saw us who wanted to have all his documents corrected because he'd received his birth certificate and found out that his name was actually different to the name he'd been using all his life. Um, but he didn't know about that. So the first thing that probably was obvious to me, I think the first thing I thought was, before I went to Lockhart River, I thought we treated, as in our industry, treated all our members equally because we had exactly the same rules for everyone. What Lockhart River showed me was that Although that might be right, not everybody starts in the same place. Uh, and the simplest one was a driver's licence. We all assume everyone has a driver's licence, but they don't have a driver's licence. So the very first thing I saw was, yes, there's difficulty with that. But on the other side, everybody has an identity. So what we needed to do was find how to prove the identity. Um, Austrac guidance is always a risk-based process. And so what we were doing while we were there was trying to find ways where people could prove who they were. 
um, because that's what we needed to know. We just needed to know who they were. So probably number one was the identification was an obvious one. Um, another thing that I noticed with the people that I was working with, I worked with a lady um, who came and saw me. We were filling in people's what we call a binding death benefit nomination form in the industry. Um, this lady had said to me uh, she was raising her son, her grandson, because her daughter had passed away, but her grandson in her mind was her son. So we filled in the binding death benefit nomination form for her and her, son, her grandson was nine and that would be okay because at the moment we will treat the grandson as an interdependent relationship. So if the lady passed away, the grandson would be entitled to the benefit. But I did say to her that as the grandson grows, it won't fit into the rules because our binding death, our, our dependence list is limited to children. So I suggested to her she needed to get a will, have the, her son or grandson um, nominated in the will and that would give guidance to the board. Um, so one of the things I noticed was the kinship that you referred to previously. Uh, in a community when a child needs to be raised, the child is raised by a person and that person considers that child to be their child. Um, so that was another thing I noticed firsthand. Uh, other issues of technology. Um, we, the very first day we had no access to technology at all. Uh, the second day we had, we were using a, um, one of the community buildings and they had a computer so we could access technology through the computer and we could use our own computer systems. But there were no computers, let alone people being able to use them. Um, technology also in terms of, I had a, men, a gentleman come to me with a driver's licence um, and I was, um, as a Justice of the Peace I was about to certify it for him and I realised he hadn't done the back, and the back is where you put the address. And he looked at it and he looked at me and he laughed and he said, they don't make photocopiers for black fellas. And I looked at it and his image was really dark and it was because he had this really, really old photocopier. So even when he was trying to fit into the rules, he couldn't because the technology wouldn't support him even to that extent. Um, so we went and we tried to lighten it up and I certified it. Anyway, um, so there's all those sort of barriers that you don't expect to see that, that, that we saw. What did you learn about the impact of language barriers while you were there? Um, fortunately, uh, Lockhart River is, uh, most of the people there speak English, but superannuation is almost a language of its, on its own. <coughs> Um, and a lot of words in superannuation are hard for people to understand. So I, fi I found speaking to them was in concepts that they would, they would understand, but most people would understand. But also uh, Indigenous culture has some, um, you have to understand how to talk to people to make sure they've understood you. Uh, there was a, something that Nathan has explained to me about um, making sure people will agree to you, agree with you straight up front. So what you need to do is make sure they've understood what they've agreed to. So you ask the questions a few different ways to make sure that the person that you're talking to really understands what you're talking to them about. The Nathan you're referring to there is Mr Boyle, Mr. Boyle from ASIC. Sorry. Yes. And is the um, phenomenon that you're referring to there um, a phenomenon that Mr Boyle referred to in his evidence in the previous round of hearings, which is gratuitous concurrence, a yeah. practice of many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of agreeing with propositions that are put to them. Yes, I believe that to be the case. Yes. I saw that uh, firsthand as well because a gentleman came and saw me and he said to me he wanted to withdraw his, his, he wanted to withdraw his superannuation. Um, and so we filled out the paperwork and for the next couple of days he came back and so I went over to him and I asked him, are, are you, can I help you, are you going okay? And what it was is he didn't want to withdraw, withdraw at all. He only wanted to withdraw a piece of it. So we talked a bit further and we got the paperwork done properly the way he wanted it. So that was a very valuable lesson to me, just in general communication with people, make sure they understand what it is you're asking them for. Mm. And what did you learn about the difficulties that people in communities such as Lockhart River can face um, with meeting the medical certification requirements imposed by superannuation funds and insurers? Do, do you mind if I keep using examples? Yes, no, not because at all. Because there was another gentleman that we helped who, he came over to see us first because he was the gentleman whose birth certificate had his Christian names around the different way to what he had thought all his life was. So we were helping him change all his documents to make it all lined up. And he said to me, um, he was actually a Q Super member, and he said, oh, I have an injury. And he did, he had lost his eye in a, bat in a fight uh, in Cairns, he told me, and he was in hospital for months. 
Um, when he got out of hospital, he no longer had his job and his eye was, um, uh, he could see. And so he asked me about could he claim his, his um, some incapacity benefits, some disability benefit. Uh, so I said to him, we filled in the paperwork. Um, I asked him, he had some, the illness had happened a number of years earlier. Uh, his in, there'd been automatic insurance applied to his account, but in 2013, the injury had occurred way before that. So I said to him, I'm not sure we can claim your insurance, but let's see if we can get the release of your preserved benefit. Um, I said, we need to find two doctors. Right, Lockhart River, the doctor is a flying doctor who comes in a couple of times a week. So that was sort of like barrier number one. Um, I then said to this gentleman, can I take your photograph, do you mind? I'll take it back to Brisbane and we'll talk to some doctors down there, uh, which is what we did, took his photograph. Uh, he loved having his photograph taken. Um, and took it back to Brisbane and I took it to, it was a QSuper member, so I took it to the QSuper insurance people. Uh, they started the communication with Lockhart River, the flying doctor, got the paperwork as much as they could through there. Turned out that his injury wasn't sufficient to stop him from working, but the doctors drilled down further into the documents and found out that he was on medication for another illness, and that one definitely would stop him from working. So by these doctors going the extra mile and doing the extra digging on behalf of that member, they were able to give this person a really early release on uh, total and permanent disability. But in Lockhart River, there is no two doctors on a corner. Like in the city, that's an easy thing to fulfil, but it's not an easy thing to fulfil in a remote community. Was there considerable work involved in assisting that member to get to the point where he could establish his total and permanent disability? Um, it, there was work involved, um, but we're there for our members. Um, this man needed help. There was no way he would have been able to do it without us. So. I wouldn't say considerable that there was work involved, but it was worthwhile work because this man ended up with not a huge account balance, but to him, it was a lot of money. And what did you learn while you were in Lockhart River about the ability of people in communities such as Lockhart River uh, to obtain death certificates upon someone's death? Um, the, the death certificate was another interesting situation. A, a lady that I spoke to mm. came and saw me to look up, she said that a man had passed away. She said, he's my brother. And then she said, well, actually, he's not my brother. He's my uncle, but my mother raised him as my brother. So there was the kinship issue up front. Um, and she said to me, he's passed away. Can we see if we can find any money? So we did some searches uh, around, and we found money actually in QSuper. So we filled in all the paperwork, and I said to her, I thought this was an easy request, to be honest. I said, can you just get me a death certificate? Um, so she said, yep, so she had to go into Cairns to organise that. Um, a few weeks, maybe a month or so later, I got a phone call from the office in Cairns, Birth, Deaths and Marriages, saying to me this lady was here to collect, a to get a death certificate, but because she was his niece, she hadn't the, quite the close enough relationship to get the death certificate, but if I certified it, if I said it was okay, it would be okay. So I said, yep, it's okay. And I, said, maybe you should look at your processes because I said, we have to, maybe you should as well. Anyway, about a month or so later again, the lady rang me again, because it turns out that in our culture, in our society, if we have someone pass away, we call a funeral director. And the funeral director is the person who sorts everything out for us, including arranging the death certificate. If you don't have a funeral director, and this man was buried culturally in his own community, the lady then had to also request her own death certificate and get it, sort of, like get it done that way. Um, we don't know that because, I mean, it's easy enough to do, but you've got to know to do it. And in fact, in that instance, I put this lady in touch with Mr Boyle at the IOP and asked him if he could help her get through this part of the process. So eventually we got the certificate and we did pay the money out. Have um, you looked at or have you used more flexible ways of proving the death of a, of a QSuper member? Yes, since, since then, because a lot of this has been learning for us and we've learned from all the experiences that we've had. We had one more recently, which we ended up getting a photocopy of the, the photograph of the tombstone. Uh, we contacted a person in the community and the community member said, I'll go and take a photograph of the tombstone if you like, which he did, sent it back in. The tombstone had date of death, date of birth, all the details on it. And we received information about the cause of death from the hospital. So that was sufficient. 
You said that while you were in Lockhart River, you met with about 100 community members. Um, can you explain what you did uh, in general terms to assist those 100 people while you were in Lockhart River? Yeah, we, um, we helped them with, in some instances it was understanding superannuation, but we, we helped with multiples of forms. Uh, binding death benefit nominations, um, people accessing money, people who are old enough to be able to get their money through retirement could not work through our systems of forms. So we're helping them fill in forms, certifying lots of documents. Um, as a justice of the peace, we were taking photocopies of stuff all the time and, photo and stamping it to send it back to the funds. Um, there was uh, financial hardship was a, a big one. There was uh, a couple of in sort of t TPD type claims, uh, just helping people fix up their own identification. Uh, so basically just about everything. Mm. So what about the people that you dealt with who were not Q Super members, who were members of either AMP, LGIA or Sun Super? What did you do to assist them? Oh, well, we, um, sometimes people had forms. One thing in Lockhart River that I noticed was people saved all their mail. So that's some of their forms they just brought in and they asked us to help them fill out for them. And then we would take, we brought them back to Brisbane with us and gave them to the funds so that the funds could process them. In some instances, we had to ring the funds and we used our contacts to talk to people and ask them, can you help us fill in these forms for these people? Um, or we could download it, download some of the forms when we were in that, that sort of pathway buildings, mm -hmm. if you like. And when you returned from Lockhart River, did you take further steps to assist? Let's start with the members of your own fund. I'll ask you about members of other funds as well, but did you take further steps upon your return to assist your members? Yes. Um, well, the first thing we did was, of course, was finalise all the documents we'd brought back and got all those cases sorted. Uh, then we decided to look further afield at what was going on in far north Queensland. It refers back to your, that piece of work there. So we looked at all our members who had lost count, well, we'd sort of lost contact with, if you like, in far north Queensland. And we downloaded, based on postcodes, all of those members. Um, we noticed when we did that, there was a couple of hundred of people who were clearly duplicate records. So we merged those records into one. Um, and it was, they were clearly duplicate because yeah, they, they obviously had moved from employer to employer. Someone had left off uh, a a couple of letters from the surname, but the date of birth were exactly the same. So it's really easy for us, really easy for us to put it together. Um, and then we started looking further at the other lost accounts. We contacted the electoral office. They gave us new addresses for the people uh, that were lost. And the electoral office also told us that there were at least 50 on our list who, had, who were deceased that we didn't know about. Um, so we then started a couple of different processes. One, we contacted births, deaths and marriages to get information about the deceased estates accounts that we knew of. And on the other side, we started contacting people in, back up in far north Queensland, targeting first people who were already in a situation where they should be able to access their money. Like they, based on what we knew, they were over their preservation age. So we started writing to them. Uh, again, Mr Boyle at ASIC assisted us to make sure our letters were written in a way that was easy for them to understand. Um, where we so we, our first communication was, can you contact us? Then once they contacted us, we started using pre-populated forms where we could. We put little notes on the, the forms to say they were for far north Queensland. Um, and therefore, when they came back in, our Q-Super would know these people were from this particular mail out and know how to treat them specially or differently if need be, with identification and whatever else might have to be. Then with the deceased ones, um, we started making uh, phone calls into far north Queensland. We started off in Lockhart River with a contact I'd made when I was up there, a gentleman who ran the art gallery. But we ended up ringing police officers, um, hospitals, uh, justice associations, anyone up there, we would, we would just ring people to look for someone or to look for someone who um, would be the next of kin. Uh, we had been given some names, I should say, to clarify that. Birth, deaths and marriages, when they give you the information, they actually tell you who, they give you the next of kin that they know. And so that was the person we were starting with to try and work through. So since we've done all this work, we have uh, reconnected 80 people with lost super totaling over $2 million and paid out 17 estates valued at 1.7 million. Uh, and, and we're still working on these. This is an ongoing 
they do take a while to sort out, and one of the biggest problems is remoteness. Um, that three day, in those three days when we helped 100 people, that's, that would take years if you don't go into a community. The best benefit that we ever had was going into a community and actually being able to be on the ground and solve problems as they came up for people. So again, Ms Melser, that sounds like a significant amount of work undertaken by QSuper. Um, what sort of impost was that on QSuper to engage in this proactive program that you've described? Well, there's no additional resources, no additional cost to us. It is our job to relocate members with their money um, and improve access to our members. It's, it's what we do. It's what we're supposed to do. And so we, it's really nothing extra. It's a, little bit, it's a little bit extra, but it's not an impost at all. It's writing your letters in a way that people can understand your letters. We'd be sending a letter anyway, so it's writing it in a certain way. Um, we'd be trying to make an estate payment. It's just going that little bit further to understand that there's some complications about this estate payment. Do you consider that you have an obligation to take the steps that you've outlined? Absolutely. As a superannuation fund, it, money has to be paid into a superannuation fund. Uh, people have no choice about superannuation having to go somewhere. So clearly we're obligated to make sure that people can get the money when they need it. And in the situations we're talking about, particularly in remote and far remote communities, they need their money. So of all the people who probably need it, it's, this is the category of member who needs to be able to access it. And it, it is our systems, that, as in the industry systems, that we've made it difficult for people. So it is also incumbent upon us to help everybody work through the systems we've created, in my personal view. And through the ongoing work that you've done following your Lockhart River trip, have you continued to identify m members of other superannuation funds in far north Queensland? Um, we have, but from an, by an interesting way, which is once we've started work in the communities, people in other communities have contacted us just in case we might have money for them. So what we do is we, well, we're a bit limited and I can explain to you why now and how later, whatever, in how we do our searches. But we were searching on the ATO website, we were searching as far as we could to see if we could find if those people had any money in super. And if they had them in another fund, we would refer that member on to the other fund. And there are now limitations on your ability yeah. to do that? Could and you explain what they are? Yes. What, the main one is when we went to Lockhart River, we could access the Australian Taxation Office website to look for people with their lost super with their permission. And then we could help them reconnect with the lost super. Now that process can only be done through a MyGov and by the person themselves. So, um, or if your person's in your own fund, you can do it, but an absolute, if a person's not in your own fund, you can't, the person has to do it themselves. So that's a real problem for people in, lo in remote communities because they probably don't have a computer and they may not have enough literacy skills to be able to access it anyway, but they're the only ones who can look for their own superannuation now. Whereas previously we could do it and we could find where they belonged. So, so that's impeded your ability <clears throat> to reunite uh, uh, members of other funds Correct. with yeah. that fund. Uh, and in addition to the work that you did after Lockhart, River, after Lockhart River in relation to the individual members, the members of QSuper and members of other funds, um, when you returned, did you take other steps designed to raise awareness of these issues, firstly within QSuper? Yes. Uh, yes. It's, it's not a hard story to share with people at QSuper. Um, I've done a number of presentations internally to the business about um, what the experiences were, what our members were experiencing, and people across the business embraced it and have taken it on board themselves as to what they can do differently in their own areas. We've done things like we have to have new art. Whenever you have to have artwork in a building, we now buy Indigenous artwork commissioned from local artists. Um, our stationery that we now use, we use an Indigenous supplier where we can for our stationery. Uh, we've, uh, we've done a reconciliation action plan, which is a really important development. Um, we've altered our written communication. Uh, a lot of the photos we now, are, are now use are more culturally diverse. Now, none of these issues cost anything because you have to do them all anyway. Um, we also send some of our trainers on a thing called Black Card Training. Uh, that's an organisation that helps people 
helps to be, help people to become more culturally aware. And we sent our trainers on that, so our trainers then came back and made sure that all the training modules that they were producing had that sensitivity attached to it. Um, and all the e-learning pieces they do, it's a very easy thing to forget about putting cultural diversity into things like that. But those sort of messages get people thinking all the time. You, you mentioned there in that list of things that you'd been involved in, uh, altering written communication. Could I ask you to look at a document that QSuper provided us, which is QSU 0008 0003 0045? Now, this is a two-page document. Perhaps if we could have both pages on the screen at once. And we see, Ms Melser, that this is an example of a simplified um, form of communication from QSuper. We see that uh, someone has inserted the details of someone who is not a QSuper member in that letter, Mr Clark Kent <laughs> from Superman <laughs> in far north Queensland. Yeah, um, Krypton's not a not one of our, our towns. No, you don't have the Krypton postcode. Don't have the Krypton postcode no. um, can you explain, uh, using this letter, the way in which you simplified uh, the language as a result of your engagement with Indigenous people in Lockhart River? Well, this is actually an example of one of the letters that was specifically designed for Lockhart River. Um, just as simple as saying, QSIVA may have some money that belongs to you. Yes. Um, just telling the person up front exactly what we're talk why, why we're communicating. <coughs> and then we go down and we talk about the examples of um, copies of documents that they could provide us. It's a little bit broader as well. And, and just the, 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 the words, the short sentences, because often our communication is full of jargon and we removed the jargon from this. this is, I should say that monitoring communication is an ongoing. We're constantly trying to make sure that we're removing jargon from our letters. But this is a particular farm. And you see the reference in the top corner, far north Queensland, that, that told the business when this letter came in what its target market was. Yes, thank you. I tender that letter, Commissioner. Draft letter to member QSU 0008 0003 0045, Exhibit 5.141. Now, after your return from Lockhart River, did you also engage in some broader advocacy work outside of QSuper? Uh, yes, I am a member of the Indigenous Superannuation Working Group. Um, at the summit of 2015, I spoke and presented on what had occurred, what I'd seen at Lockhart River and what I had experienced at Lockhart River. Um, and I've spoken a few times since then at different places about what we experience in Lockhart River, what we've done around the postcode work, the Reconciliation Action Plan, encouraging other funds to take some action as well. Mm. And are you able to give us some examples of some other superannuation funds who are currently members of the Indigenous Superannuation Working Group? Um, it's in the, um, the summit document. Yes, I'll, um, I'll bring that up to assist you. That's RCD. You. 0014-0035-0061. So this is a um, report from the Indigenous Superannuation Working Group Summit from 2016. And perhaps if we turn to 0065 within that document. We see there the superannuation funds involved at that time in 2016 with the Indigenous Superannuation Working Group. Yes. You see that there, yes, Ms Melsa? Sorry, yes, I do. So we see Australian Super, CBUS, Colonial First State, HESTA, Host Plus, QSuper, MLC, NAB, GESB, Super South Australia, UniSuper and VicSuper. Yes. Uh, now, I tender that document, Commissioner. Report of Indigenous Superannuation Summit, December 16, RCD 0014-0035-0061, Exhibit 5.142. Now, that was a report following the 2016 uh, summit of the working group. I want to ask you some questions about the previous summit in 2015. You attended that summit as well? Yes, I did. 
and that was attended by other industry representatives and regulators, including Austrac. Yes, it was. Uh, and you presented at that summit about your experiences at Lockhart River. Yes, I did, yes. Uh, now, prior to that summit, the working group released a discussion paper that included recommendations. Do you recall that? Just briefly, sorry. Uh, to assist you, I'll just bring that up as well. That's RCD 0014-0035-0001. There's a, if I take you, this is the report again of the 2015 summit, but I'll take you within that document to 0029. we could have 0028 and 0029 both on the screen, we'll see that an appendix to that report was a discussion paper released prior to the summit. And we see the recommendations <coughs> of the working group on the right-hand page. And the fourth of those was that the superannuation industry, through the working group, engage with the ABA, Austrac, and state and federal governments on establishing protocols on how best to address identification challenges faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in relation to superannuation. So you see that that was one of the recommendations circulated prior to the 2015 summit? Yes. Uh, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Report of Indigenous Superannuation Summit, July 15, RCD 0014-0035-0001, Exhibit 5.143. Now, that recommendation was discussed at the 2015 summit? Uh, I believe so, yes. And Austrac undertook, as a result of discussions at that summit, to go away and produce such a protocol. Is that right? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and you provided feedback on drafts of that protocol? Yes, I did. And that protocol became the Austrac guidance uh, that I referred to earlier, which yes. was released in 2016? Yes, it did. Now, uh, you uh, may have heard before my reference to the evidence of Mr Boyle and Mrs Edwards that although that Austrac guidance has been acknowledged by financial services entities at a high level, um, that they believe not enough is being done to ensure that those at the coalface are aware of and applying that guidance. What can you tell us about the way QSuper ensures that the people at the coalface in your organisation are applying the Austrac guidance? Well, um, it is an, it's a, uh, an ongoing journey um, that we continue to make sure that we are being as flexible as possible with our members to help them to provide their identification. And it's for all members, um, because although Indigenous people have issues, people sometimes in domestic violence situations, homeless people have the same the same issues. The principle we try to apply is that everybody has an identity and our job is to help them prove the identity to the, to the point where we're comfortable that we are not paying the wrong person or doing the wrong thing. So there's a number of issues ongoing with QSuper uh, where it's an awareness issue uh, and we've recently released an Austra a video which is, a, um, which is a, an e-learning piece of work that's going out to the business, I think, this month, because I think this is Cultural Awareness Month. So it's an ongoing issue to remind people about the flexibility that Austrac allows through its guidance notes. Can I ask you to look at another document that QSuper has provided us, which is QSU 0008 0007 0001. Now, Ms Melster. Is this an example of uh, an alternative, more flexible way of proving the identity of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person? Uh, yes, it is. It's a perfect example. Yes. So this is a letter that you received at QSuper mm -hmm. uh, uh, in relation to um, the identity of one of your members. That's correct. And the details of that member have been removed from this version of the letter, but we see that it is a letter from Junkuri Laka, the Community Justice Group and Community Legal Centre for Mornington Island, a remote Aboriginal community in Queensland. That's correct, yes. Uh, and in this document we see that the Community Legal Centre 
told Q Super that the particular person was a community member of Mornington and well known to us, as are her parents and the wider family, who are all members of our Indigenous community. The person is currently living at an address and a photograph of the person was attached to the letter. That's correct, yes. And was Q Super satisfied based on this letter of the identity of this person for the yes. purpose of the Know Your Customer requirements in the Austrac legislation? Yes, we were. Uh, and is this an example of how the Austrac guidance can work, the sort of document that can be provided um, that superannuation funds can accept as an alternative form of proof of identification? Yes, it is. Thank you. I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, Identity Declaration, Juncuri, Laka, Mornington, Ireland, QSU, 0008, 0007, 0001, Exhibit 5.144. Again, Ms Melser, I want to ask you if it's an impost on QSuper to have these sorts of alternative procedures for allowing uh, a person, such as a person living in um, Mornington, Ireland, uh, to prove their identity to QSuper. No, that's not an impost at all. Um, we look at it as it's just what we do. We need to work out a way of getting identity proven and this is a way of doing it. Now, having visited Lockhart River in 2014, earlier this year, did you visit another remote Indigenous community with the ASIC Indigenous Outreach Program? Uh, yes, I did. And was that community the APY lands? Uh, yes, it was. Can you explain where the APY lands are? Uh, yeah, the APY lands are in Central Australia. It, they border uh, the Northern Territory, Western Australia, and they're in South Australia. So they're in that corner there. And are the majority of people who live in the APY lands Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Um, I would say so, yes. And how long did that trip go for? Uh, that trip was for five days, though I was only with the trip for the first two. And were there Q Super members in uh, the APY lands? No, there were no Q Super members. And so why did you attend that trip? Uh, Mr Boyle asked me to go along to provide some support for the other funds who were going, because they'd never been into a community before, um, because of my probably interest and my desire to help and to understand what the issues are um, that Indigenous people face when they're dealing with superannuation. Mm -hmm. And do you recall which other superannuation funds attended that trip? Yeah, there was uh, Prime Super, Hester, Australian Super and Super SA. And how many towns were visited on that trip? Uh, five towns, I believe, were visited. And can you tell us a bit about the APY lands and life in the APY lands? Um, I think I think my view is that life in the APY lands is probably pretty harsh. Um, they have the same issues of Lockhart River in terms of, I would expect, um, economic type issues, uh, unemployment, high cost of living. It's quite harsh territory in Central Australia. Uh, their remoteness, uh, th they'd only received, I think, mobile phone access probably two or three weeks prior to the visit. So when you're trying to access a superannuation fund via the internet and you have no phone access, that's almost impossible. So the feelings of remoteness and disconnected to your superannuation must be huge in those communities. Uh, same issues to do with identification that we've seen, same issues of literacy, harder issues in the fact that most of the people in those communities don't speak English at all. So we had to work through um, interpreters I learned that there is no Indigenous word for superannuation, so it's not a very good place to start <laughs> when you can't even have a word to define that. Um, we talked about making sure that we didn't use words that are common in our language, our superannuation language, that is a consolidation, preservation, make it simple so people can understand um, uh, what we're talking about. And were people in the APY lands members of the superannuation funds that you identified? Were there members there from Hester, Prime Super, Australian Super and Super SA? I believe so. I believe um, Australian Super and Super SA were probably the most, had the most members. Uh, and then Hester and I think, I'm not sure if Prime Super had any or if they had a very few. Uh, and You've described some ways in which the experiences in which people living in uh, that area were even 
more difficult than the experiences of the people living in Lockhart River, but were the issues that you saw the same style of issues that you had seen on your Lockhart River trip? Yes, the same style. Uh, in some ways, um, they, were, well, they were worse. They were worsened conditions. Like I said, uh, English language makes it hard when we do all our communications, as in the industry does all our communications probably in one language. Um, the, the jargon, it, it just seemed harder. It, was, it seemed like life was harder there than it was in Lockhart River. Mm. Now, can I ask you, Ms Melsa, having had those experiences both in Lockhart River and in the APY lands and having embarked on the advocacy work that you've embarked on in recent years, um, can I ask you some questions about possible ways to improve the experience of vulnerable people, such as people living in these mm -hmm. communities in relation to superannuation? Um, can I start by asking you about binding nominations? Uh, the legislation currently only permits a person to nominate their legal personal representative or a dependent to receive death benefits. Is that correct? That's correct. And you referred before to the example of the grandmother uh, who wanted to nominate her nine-year-old grandson to receive death benefits. Yes, correct. Uh, now, I think I understood your evidence to be that whilst that nine-year-old grandson remained a dependent, that would be permissible. But when the grandson ceased being dependent on the grandmother, our legislative framework would not allow that nomination. Is that correct? That's, yeah, that's correct. My understanding is that uh, a dependent includes a person's child, irrespective of their age. Um, once this child is older than, um, like, he's no longer dependent on, the, the, her, on his grandmother, he would no longer be considered her child. And that's because he's not her biological child, correct. he's her grandchild. And he's it? not her adopted child it, under the system that... Um, that I suppose the Australian generally uses. So I think we should be looking at some extension of that definition of dependency to include uh, a cultural, uh, a child who's adopted under cultural law. Now that, that should be of no impost because it allows the, the member to identify exactly who they consider to be their child. I, I can't think of anything worse than a small child growing up thinking a person's their mother and then their mother dies, and a system like the superannuation system says, no, sorry, we don't recognise you as that person as your mother anymore, uh, because you, know, you didn't sign our paperwork or, or whatever, do our legal system. Uh, so I think it definitely should be expanded to include children. Mm. And in that way to reflect the kinship structures that operate in Aboriginal yes. and Torres Strait Islander communities? And respect them, yes. Yes. Uh, can I ask you also about the early release of money held in superannuation? Does QSuper permit early release of a person's superannuation where they're experiencing severe financial hardship? Uh, yes, it does. And do you know roughly what percentage of funds that QSuper permits to be released prior to preservation age are released on the basis of severe financial hardship? I think, it, I think it's around 30%. Thank you. And... Can you give us an example of a situation in which QSuper has permitted the early release of superannuation to someone in a remote community based on severe financial hardship? I, I dealt with a lady in Lockhart River who... Um, there, were, there were two elements to the, 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 the arm or the financial hardship criteria. One is that you have to be on income support payments for 26 weeks and Centrelink or DHS provide a form for that. So she had that, that was fine. The second part is that you cannot meet your daily living expenses. And that, that's a comp that sort of can be quite a complex document. So when this lady and I did this work, this lady basically owned nothing. Um, she owed, she, she needed money to buy food. Um, she was living quite, all she had was her income support payment. She didn't have a home really to live in. And so between her and I, we filled in the forms for her and, and got her money released, some money released for her. Now, to your knowledge, do all superannuation funds permit early release of superannuation on the grounds of severe financial hardship? No, they do not. Uh, and do you know of the funds who do not, why not? Um, I'm aware of a few that don't. Um, I'm aware Super SA doesn't, but I'm also aware they are working towards... Super SA is a um, government fund 
their, they're also public sector funds, so they have to have legislative change, and I'm aware they're working towards getting legislative change. The other two funds I'm aware of are Sun Super and Rest Super, but I, I can't tell you why they don't do it. Now, um, it might be said that releasing funds, doing an early release of superannuation on the basis of severe financial hardship is much more onerous for a superannuation fund than other gateways to early release of superannuation because of the matters that you've just described which need to be satisfied. Again, do you regard it as an impost on QSuper uh, to assess whether or not a person is in need of um, their superannuation on the basis of severe financial hardship? Um, you are correct in your first assessment that these are the largest um, claims to assess but absolutely not an impost because these are the people who need, it is these people, it's their money and they're in a situation where they need it. Uh, it's not a, we're not talking about because they want to go and do something, something frivolous, they need it to live. So I uh, know I don't consider it an impost at all. Thank you. Now, can I ask you, Ms Melsa, whether you have a view on whether it would be beneficial to lower the preservation age for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Um, my view on that is no. Um, and the reason I say that is because I, the, the argument behind lowering it is because um, people of Indigenous, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander heritage have a lower life expectancy. I don't want to give up on that battle of closing that by saying let's just reduce the preservation age and let them get their money earlier. But I do acknowledge that that's the truth and that that's what happens. In Lockhart River the life expectancy is even lower uh, than, it's lower again because of the remoteness I suspect of the community. So I think there are other ways that we can do that. We can get, people need to get their money to live as well. Um, one of the options we could look at is some guidance around how we handle total and permanent disability payments. And maybe one of the criteria that the trustees and doctors can look at is the life expectancy of the person that they're dealing with, the, dif the distance from where they are to getting health, um, to see doctors, to, to get treatment, all of those things must alter a person's life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So if we can be more broad about that, that would be helpful. Uh, now, are you familiar with the evidence that Mr Boyle and Mrs Edwards gave in the previous round of hearings on their views on the value of financial services entities asking their customers and members whether they consider themselves to be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Yes, I am. And do you have a view about that? Uh, yeah, my view on that is that we shouldn't, I, I'm not a believer in collecting personal data unless we have a reason to use the personal data. Uh, in QSuper we strive to really understand the person that we're talking to them and understand what their situations and solving for that member um, and therefore we don't really need to know what the heritage is of the person we're talking to um, because we, we just like to help and that's, that's the message I try and get out all the time is just to work with the member who, it doesn't matter what the heritage is and where they've come from. Um, Mr Boyle and Mrs Edwards gave evidence that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been asked to identify uh, as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander over a very long period of time in connection with numerous services such as health and education services. Does that affect your view on this topic? Uh, no, because um, I think with health it's a really important I, it's, it's important for policy to know where Indigenous people are because they have health issues. Superannuation for me is we should be treating all our members equally. But what I mean by equally is equally giving them access to their money, trying to understand their story, understand, like I said, everyone has an identity. Just work with them to work out what the identity is. Try and work what, how they can show who their identity is, I should say. Um, working with them to find out what their needs are. And you don't need to know their heritage to know that that's like normal compassion to try and work through with people. Where there's a real good policy need, I'm absolutely in favour of it. Um, I read in Mr Boyle's, I think, uh, evidence uh, or his um, statement about in banking, because people in banks, uh, bank, they, to make sure that people who are in uh, income support payments aren't, getting, aren't in high fee accounts. Uh, and if you indicate you're Indigenous, then that might solve that. For me, a bank only needs to look at where the money's coming from to know a person's in income support payments. And if they do a little bit of extra effort, they could put that money into a, a fee-free account. So I think there are ways where asking someone to identify 
isn't, is like, isn't the solution. Um, also, as you said before, I think, Indigenous people are very diverse. Um, and they're diverse where they live, they're diverse where they work. Um, so I don't, I, I'm not sure that we need to put them all into a, a group and number them. Can I ask you, Ms Melsa, reflecting on these experiences that you've had in recent years, uh, dealing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities, what are your views on the steps that superannuation funds should be taking to assist those members and other vulnerable members? I think step number one is to understand who your member is. Um, when the opportunity presents to go to a community, take it. Like if, if ASIC knocks on your door and says, I want to go to a community, come with us, do it. Because the amount that you learn in two or three days about what your member's needs are is amazing. Uh, there are also a lot of people already on the ground, like uh, councillors, ICANN, OHAB, First Nations Foundation, a lot of people already working. So reach out to them and offer some assistance uh, and what you can do. Um, I would say understanding your members is probably your main. Is that? Yeah. Yes. And in your view, does the superannuation industry do enough to ensure that funds are acting in the best interests of their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members in remote communities and other vulnerable members? I think the funds can do more, but I think it's because they just don't know. Um, I think, like I said, going out to a community changed my whole... I, I thought we did everything for members and I thought we treated all our members equally. Going out to the community made me see how hard life is and how equal isn't the same for everybody. So nothing replaces talking to your members. But I think funds have that in their DNA to do that. That's because every time I've spoken to a fund or every time I've spoken to a group, people always walk away going, working out what they can do, how they can work. And what I would say to everybody, just make a start. Just do something. Grab your lost super accounts list, look at your postcodes, just make a start. And is there anything special about QSuper, which means it has been able to engage with its members in these communities in the ways that you've described, that means that that's not possible for other superannuation funds? Well, I think QSuper is special, but I might be biased about that. Um, and QSuper is very member focused, always has been member focused. Um, I don't see why what we're doing is so special that other funds can't be doing it as well, to be honest. Thank you, Ms Melsa. I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms Orr. Mr Kelly, have you got anything? No. Thank you very much, Ms Melsa. You may step down and you're excused. Thank you. Commissioner, perhaps if we could take a break until 11 uh, to allow for the next... That's I'm sorry. Until... Past. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. 11.05. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'll resume sitting at 5 past 11. <laughs>